This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we should have everybody here. Happy New Year, everybody. Ready? Yes. <clears throat> All right. I'd like to call this meeting of the Veterans Service Advisory Committee to order. Uh, start off with roll call members. I'll go down the line that I have here on the list. Earl Newsom, I'm here. Sarah Henley is here. Lee Rebus. Greg. Here. So long. All right. Jim Cunningham. Here. Jim Brennan. Here. Oh, he's there. Good. Larry Wallace. Shelly has resigned. And Kitty Myers. Here. That is all of us. All right. Our next agenda item is public comment. Is he downstairs? Did he make it? He has not arrived. So. <laughs> okay. We've had one individual. Uh, Pat Patterson, who signed up for pl public comment uh, about issues he has with POWR, suspected POW, uh, former prisoner of uh, war. What I'd like to do is, he is he still trying to drive in? He is still trying to drive in, so he could still arrive before the end of the meeting. Okay. What I'd like you guys to entertain is that we yeah. like put this aside, and if he shows up before the meeting, that we, we give him that time. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Our next agenda item, we're moving right along, is to approve the minutes for our, uh, boy, really going back now, the May, <laughs> May, May the 8th, 2023 minutes. And Move to approve. Second. All right. Move it second. It's been moved to second. Jim Cunningham, second. Jim Cunningham, second. All right. Oh, any, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. The minutes are approved. All right. Next, next agenda item. We're moving right along, guys. <laughs> uh, we didn't, uh, remember our last meeting? We were getting an update on the Veteran Entrepreneur Program. So we're going to uh, go back to that because we had technical difficulties before. Do we have our person that's going to give us the update? Megan is sitting right next to you, sir. <laughs> Sorry about that. Didn't know it was her. Go ahead, Megan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, update on the Veteran Entrepreneur Program. We are currently working with our general counsel and I forgot the name of the college. South Texas College of Law to get our um, trademark completed. I sent all the information last week to them. The University of Arizona, we weren't able to work with them, so we had to start the process over. But um, our general counsel were able to get the TBC logo uh, trademarked fairly quickly, and so we're hoping that this goes through just as fast. And then um, we have no backlog. We have a full team, four people are all in the field. We recently restructured our maps, bringing me out of um, over being over a district. And uh, so now we have four districts divided into the state and they're all working very hard. And before January 1st, we all became accredited small business consultants through AASBC. So we are continuing to work and learn more so that we can better assist the veterans. Anyone have any questions? I'm sorry, I didn't catch what college you said you were working with. South Texas College of Law in Houston. South Texas College of Law. Okay, thank you. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Questions? Okay. I've got one alibi. I forgot I was so much trying to get the count back on the uh, the minutes from uh, the, the agenda that we have here today. Because uh, we also had the minutes from the August 9th on there. Um, my name just needed an e, a e at the end. Okay. Our next discussion item for today is um, we're supposed to also do oh the a communication update web resources and that's on there areas of focus for 2024. If you remember last time, those areas that we had that we had. 21 recommendations that was sent uh, that was sent into TBC. Uh, Mr. Pal Colonel Palladino gave us the areas to look at, so we've been given full reign to see what what you, ladies and gentlemen, think we should be focusing on in 2024. I asked Angela to send a couple of things out. One was a, a television program that is, that showed up in Dallas where uh, this guy had a less than honorable discharge. And he waited to wait, wait the last minute and try to get his discharge updated. Uh, DOD didn't approve his uh, change in character of discharge, but when they looked at his ailments, because he did serve on the ground in Vietnam, uh, he did he was authorized care with the VA for his care, medical care. Tragically, it was only in the last couple of months, so there's no way of telling how much money he may or may not spend, or his family may have spent uh, to, to, I think it was Parkinson was one of the, the you know, what he may have um, been able to get his care for. And, you know, depending on how long, because the TV article didn't go into the you know, DOD disapproved it, but who knows if, if he had applied to the VA earlier and tried to get his discharge, he may, maybe while he was getting his care, he could have worked with a service officer years ago and maybe DOD might have been more, more uh, friendly to upgrade his discharge when they saw that he had an ailment. Because basically what you saw in the article, they looked at the time he was AWOL and said, you know, we're really such a long time that we're not going to update it. But what I noticed in looking in that article that they said one of the reasons he was, reason he was AWOL because his dad got sick and he went AWOL to go home. And, um, help take care of the family. And it looks like DOD didn't approve the change in the character of his discharge because they said he was having some kind of flashbacks or something before he went in the military. So, but again, if he had, he had applied and worked with a service officer years earlier, it may have been a change. Uh, I also, Angela also sent you uh, another article I came across that talked about the number of veterans not aware of benefits from the VA. So it talks about outreach. So I, I sent those two things out because when I saw the article on TV about the guy who didn't apply for his benefits until later in life, and then saw the VA article, uh, it made me think about uh, the guys and uh, guys and ladies I'm working with on my other committee, the POWs. Uh, there's a few POWs out there. Uh, right now, VA says they have less than 2,000 in the system. And one of the things I'm working with on my committee on the VA is uh, there's such a large list of presumptives out there for uh, Ill illnesses for, for POWs. We're looking at saying, OK, you got these guys that en enroll with VA for care, but they're not in receipt of benefits. Surely they got to have something wrong with them. And I think it's less than 200. So one of the things we're asking the VA to say, OK, you know, you got this. They've been kicking this ball down down the road for years saying how many live in POWs they, they can have. VA, VA will only swear by the number in their system. When I first got on the committee, the estimates were it was 15,000 POWs living, and that was in 2015. Listen to that. The VA fact sheet in 2015 estimated 15,000 living POWs. Now they're saying there's only 2,000 in the VA system. Mm -hmm. so, you know, there's, there's some crazy numbers in, in between there, and they keep going between DOD and VA saying what's the real number of living. But I said, okay, we can kick this down the road, but the largest number will are the, the World War II and the Korea POWs. 
and they're they're going real fast. I got one committee member who just turned a hundred. <laughs> he's he's an artery old guy, but 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 so at least we're trying to get him to say, you know, you got a hundred and something that's not get, that's getting care of, that's not getting benefits. At least watch them before they die to see they get that. And then you combine that with the article, with sixty percent of uh, the veterans up there are not aware. It still seems like there's a mission for uh, to me, mission for outreach. One of the things I was thinking about, and I want to present it to the group for a possible talk topic is targeted outreach to senior veterans. And I give you an example. You know, there's there, I looked at some stats, and when you're talking about zero to 100% service connected, let's just give you the big number. Everybody would love to be 100%. I wouldn't because I don't want to be that bad. But only 20% of uh, veterans who've been receiving benefits are 100%. And, and then when you go 70%, uh, it's about 9.4, 80%, 9.7, 90%, 9.9. I bring this up because I'm in the baby group of uh, Vietnam era, and that's Vietnam era and the Gulf War, the two largest groups out there. Uh, there are people, I think like myself, when I first retired in 1995, I had, I, had, I had a back injury in the military. I, I went through the TAP briefing, got 10%. Then later on, I said, hey, guys, you know, I had surgery, and I asked for a rebound. I got 20%, and I just left it alone because I was a retiree, because anything they took out of my, they gave me out of uh, disability, took out of my retirement pay. And I said, what the heck? I didn't worry about it. Uh, but later, and after, after 22 years, I went back. And I went from 20% to 70%. That's a big difference in disability pay. One of the reasons I didn't go in earlier, guys were telling me, you know, you ought to go in because, you know, I had some people look at my record and say, yeah, you got this part, but you didn't talk about that part when you submitted your claim again. But I said, heck with it, they're going to take it out of my retirement pay. But I bring this up because I think there's a lot of people out there that's kind of like me. That just kind of blew it off. Now I had the odd thing about it coming out of my retirement pay, but all you know, a lot of veterans are <laughs> retirees who could be looking later on in life and coming back. We know there's the fear of going to the VA and asking them to relook and say, you know, say I'm 20 or 30 percent, they might reduce it, and there is a chance of that. But one of the things uh, came out with discussions uh, with the VBA people on my other committee. It's like, isn't there a magic number out there where they don't look back? In fact, it is. If you've been service connected for an ailment for 20 years, and then the VA goes and you submit a claim again, you can submit the claim and say, I think it's worse, but you don't have to worry about your, your disability being reduced after 20 years. Think about how many people, you know, who, 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 got their disability over 20 some years ago, but scared to go to the VA or don't know that there's that, that general rule for the VA 20, back, 20 years to look back. And if you look at the senior uh, veterans, like people who are over 50, I'll say 55 and above, it's probably a lot of them out there who got a, the, the, uh, that group. First of all, they don't know about the benefits. Then if you look at people who are service connected, that maybe, you know, if a service officer talks to them and, and tells them about this fact of, you know, let's look at your record, let's look at what you had 20 years ago. Yeah, in many cases, your condition is probably worse. So if it's worse than it was, and you don't and you don't have to worry about them, uh, reducing your disability because it's been over 20 years, maybe we go and go again. Because I'm sure there's a number out there that don't put something in because they're scared that the VA is going to come back and take it away from them. So I just submit that. That's why I had that Angela submit that stuff to you, you ladies and gentlemen, to say uh, it, that it does seem to be a need for for continued outreach. But maybe you might want to look at targeted outreach because, especially uh, to to the senior veterans that's out there, because when you're talking about you're getting close to retirement, or you retired, that that bump you get in your disability pay may be that difference of. Uh, retired at 65, you know, at 70 compared to 65 because you got that extra money, something for consideration. I just bring that up. Uh, one thing that I was thinking about was uh, targeted outreach uh, for senior veterans to see if they want to go back and have a read. Any comments on that? What about you guys? Well, I, no, I, th I think there's some the basis to do that. Uh, I have some of the characteristics you just described, 73 now. 
so yeah, oh, I think. Same age. <laughs> well, I'll be there. 73 next week. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think there's a basis to do that. There's, there, you described it well, Earl. There's a reluctance among a lot of veterans to re-engage with VA for fear of uh, reduction in benefit. And uh, this is really a complicated matter. We, I've, I've been involved in this issue on and off with various uh, uh, groups. And uh, how VA is addressing these is, is changed. Well, let me rephrase that. How they addressed even questions about it has changed over the last 15 years. And one of the things that I think is impacting uh, how they're addressing it, what they say, and what the actual impl implementation of policy is, is, I think, is two different things. And many times we see, I'm, I'm convinced that there are, uh, that budget constraints and fear of, of budget uh, problems uh, are impacting uh, uh, consideration of legitimate claims uh, over the last several years. We've just seen, you know, there's proposals out there to, to change eligibility based on a whole lot of metrics that are, that are budget driven, frankly. And uh, I think it's, I'm, it's kind of a balancing act. I mean, you legitimately have to consider budget constraints and budget issues as we have these huge deficits uh, and it's gonna impact everybody fairly or unfairly. It's pretty exasperating to hear about veterans in line at VA facilities behind immigrants or migrants that have come in that they're, they're you know, that they're using VA facilities now. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a real issue and it's, it, it could, it could become a bigger issue. So regardless of politics or how people feel about border issues, I think when it starts impacting access to, for healthcare for veterans, uh, that we all have to engage in that and, and be uh, be aware that that's something that's that, that we need to, well, put it this way, I hope we don't have to address it, but I think realistically there's already evidence that this is impacting certain veterans' health facilities as far as access. So, mm -hmm. it, You know, the, the PACT Act also addressed it a little bit, you know, when you talk about exposures uh, to toxic chemicals. So some people, you know, were getting the relook and going back because of the PACT Act, but and I agree with you. I talked to a lot of veterans and again, they said, well, I don't want to go back to the VA because they might reduce it. So I'm pretty sure there's that Delta out there uh, that probably forgot about it or haven't gone back to it. I don't know if our uh, county service officers may have an idea about the average age of people coming in asking to look at claims. Uh, and uh, but you know, again, seems like you kind of agree with what we were talking about, uh, Colonel Palladino. Uh, possible topics, how you doing? Girl, hi, fine, sir. Just want to say hello to everybody and thank you for serving on this committee. Hi, Jim, how you doing? Hey, brother, good. I see, uh, I see I everybody up there. Yep, I see James, James, Jim Cunningham there. I see uh, Sarah, Greg, Larry, oh, Larry Kitty, yeah. So I know the uh what do they what do they call you guys the usual suspect? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're all doing a great job and I really appreciate um you know you participating and you know you make a difference and you know under Earl's leadership you came up with you know a, a new way of uh presenting our rec your recommendations to the commission you, you know and to us and we've taken a lot of those recommendations and we've tried to implement uh, you know, some of them. And so I think that this committee really shows the other committees you know, how to make a difference and uh, you know, how to develop recommendations, present them to us, we look at them, we see what's feasible, and then we, and then we implement uh, what we can implement. And, uh, and I think we've done that on a number of occasions. So um, you know, keep doing it and I appreciate you know, all your support. And then we even got tele, we can even do now these video teleconferences so you don't always have to fight the traffic. You know, you can do it this way. So I appreciate it all. And uh, that's all, I just wanted to come in there and tell you that and thank you for for what you do, okay? Thank you, sir. Well, uh, and what, else, you. Uh, what I was saying, you walked in, we were talking about the future area to look at and we're kicking around the idea of targeted outreach to sing, uh, 
when I say uh, uh, senior veterans, veterans over 55, and brought up the point there's a fear out there, and, and uh, Jim was also coming, there's a fear out there coming out back to the VA years later because they might reduce my, my amount on my disability. Mm. But the VA does have a basically a policy that if it's over 20 years, right, that they won't reduce right. it. And how many people know that? Mm. And, and uh, just as you were walking in, we, we were talking about Everybody seems to have had that same idea. That right. Heard people say that, and I don't know if the county service officers can give us an idea with the average age of people out there. But you know, we see that that might be something to look at because if somebody, uh, you know, had ten to twenty percent, mm -hmm. twenty some odd years right. ago, they may have been afraid to come in. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it. I gave my own personal example. I didn't do it because it would just come out of my retirement right. pay. Right. But guess what? I went back and I went back. Went from twenty percent. In ninety seven to seventy percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. You never know. No, and then you know the other thing that kicks in again. If you're over fifty percent, right, then you you know then that qualifies you for long term care from the VA. So then you talk about you know as you're getting older, are you going to pay for long term care insurance when you're over seventy percent? Right. Then you qualify for services at a state veterans home. So there's some right. things in there, and I don't know if if your experience with the county service officers that you got an idea of what's the average age of somebody coming in. We we hit people real good with the tap briefings right. when they're getting out, but do we come back later on? We and, do and, get and, We yeah. do have a, a, a good batch of veterans who are older. You know, mm -hmm. we, we do, but I don't, but I think you're right. We should, we should make an effort, you know, we say 55 or mm -hmm. above or mm -hmm. 65 or above, you know, there are veterans that kind of, you know, they, they're, uh, you know, when they get retired right. and they're not as engaged, you know, and we should try to keep them engaged, you know, but I do think, I mean, we do serve, there's a lot of people that will come to us and say, my dad, mm -hmm. my uncle, you know, and, uh, you know, never filed a claim or needs to look at their claim. And so we, we are helping this, this older generation, um, you know, but there's also those that kind of fade off. They fade off into retirement, and you don't hear from them again. So I do think that we we should make an we should make an effort to do that. You know, not just in like the veteran mm -hmm. homes, but mm -hmm. you know, throughout the communities. You know, that plus the rural, the veterans in the rural communities really need extra emphasis to reach out for them. So we're trying to do these benefit fairs around the state that Angela is coordinating with her team with local government is, uh, you know, with the VLB, you know, and us doing them together. We were doing them before the pandemic and the pandemic kind of put a kibosh on them, but now we're starting to do them again. And so, you know, and we're trying to get them in rural areas. Like we have one in San Angelo coming up and, you know, we're going to start planning these more and more. And, uh, but just to get the uh, knowledge of benefits out in the rural areas and for one, that's one area, but then the other is, you know, for uh, elderly veterans, you know, or, you know, older veterans, I'm going to say elderly. So I think you know, we're on the right, a good track. Yeah, Tom, uh, uh, yeah. something just occurred to me. Well, one of the things we might consider is outreach to the different service organizations, VFW, American Legion, Disabled Veterans of America, different groups that have uh, 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 have certified people assisting with disability claims with their group to survey them in some fashion about what they're seeing in the last two years or so that is kind of a profile of the things that they're identifying as, as issues that they're seeing recurring and how it's being addressed at the VA that might be a little different than what the general perception is. Yeah, that's a really good idea. We could do because that. We could go through I think, go ahead. I go think ahead. that there's, I think different areas, different places around the state are, you know, going to different board, you know, they may go to Houston or they may be in Waco or whatever. And every place deals, you know, they have, they have their rules, but every place has different, uh, uh, patterns, if you will, about how things are reviewed and, and what their success rates or issues have been to see if there's some pattern here that's consistent with perceptions of what's going on out there. I think it's a great idea. I think we can do that. We can work with the leadership at the Better Service Organizations and see if, you know, they'd be willing to, you know, forward a survey, our survey off to all their members. Uh, but I, I, th I don't see why they wouldn't. I don't see why they wouldn't do that. I think that's a great idea anyway. Did yeah, I, did, I think it might tell us some in things that we might not see empirically. Yeah, and we can also do it through our, our EVETS listing, which is, um, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands are on our EVETS, you know, recipient list. We can do a survey through there. So we could try different ways, you know, to try to survey uh, veterans out in the community, you know. And I, yeah, I, I don't yeah. think it has to be a massive deal. I think if we can, 
narrow down to get maybe 50 of them that, uh, that with the different vet organizations and different county service officers, urban and a mix of urban county service officers with rural county service officers. And let's see if we see a pattern or see something that's popping up or recurring on, on a, on a big scale. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another area I thought about, you know, you guys got Buku YouTube videos mm -hmm. and, and, one thing I was thinking again is, you know, I know it's hard to get the boots on the ground to those places, but if you can modify one of your YouTube videos, like a thing for senior veterans to know, you know, uh, you can apply for your health clear later, you know, number, it, it, you, you can enroll in VA, right. it doesn't cost to enroll, you know, the benefits of, of uh, that you could use for the VA as you age. The other thing I, I'll tell you I've run into personally, I've helped two families get their family member in the state veterans home in Houston, the mm -hmm. brand new home. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, one of them was a hundred, a hundred year old, a guy that turned a hundred, a hundred right. years old in the veterans home. And in the last six months, one of my cousins whose husband was a hundred percent service connected veteran, when she was telling me what was going on with him, he was admitted to Michael DeBakey. I said, what are they telling you? She said, well, I've been getting home care, but he's getting to be too much for me. And I said, uh, ask the social worker when she comes around to see about uh, admitting him to the new home in Houston. First of all, my cousin didn't know about it. Second of all, what was interesting, when the social worker came to the ward, she said, I'll check to see if they have a dementia unit there. You know, I told my cousin, you know what they told me? The social worker didn't know. She ought to know that whether it's a good, you know, if she's doing uh, discharge planning for 100% service connected veteran on the ward at Michael DeBakey. She ought to know about the Johnson State Veteran Home less than five miles away. Bottom line, he's admitted there now. So that's that other thing, too. I noticed the land board there. But again, the senior veterans, you know, here he had the, the person, the wife was getting 20 hours a week for somebody there, but they gave her all those other hours. Now the guy is there at a, basically a brand new home. So I think, again, there's a lot of knowledge not out there for our senior veterans on what's out there with state veterans. They have to keep on. it up because yeah. even if you, you inform the people that work, say, in the VA mm -hmm. or the service organizations, they switch out. Right. And then you get turnover. Mm -hmm. And then you got to educate the, mm -hmm. the, the new staff. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's what to work on on, on, on how, to, how to maintain that mm -hmm. knowledge and communication. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to go. Thank you, sir. I don't want to, you know, yeah. otherwise I'll hijack Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. want to catch you while you were here. So you did great. great. Appreciate it. Bye. Yeah. Uh, so anybody else beside, beside uh, Mr. Brennan there who's got an idea of comments on, on some topics we might want to look at besides well, this is, targeted outreach? This, this is Jim Cunningham. Um, I just wanted to comment uh, what, about what you're talking about. Uh, for many, many years, I didn't even think about applying to VA at all. Uh, I am a senior. I'm 75. And I just recently applied to VA. And uh, they initially came back and gave me a 50% disability. Uh, I went back and applied a little bit further, and I now have an 80% disability. So, and and uh, no reduction at all in mm -hmm. retirement benefits at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I think it's very worthwhile, and it's something we ought to do. Jim, I'm wondering whether there's no di difference based on your age, if they're making a differentiation because if you're over a certain age, because uh, there there is something to do with that. I, I frankly, I'll have to go back and research that a little bit and see what they said. But uh, I'd be curious. Uh, I think that's an important point. If you can get some clarification from them about that, yeah, I, I'll go back and research that. Um, I, I don't think it was something that was really hard to overcome at all. But uh, and it may have just been the amount of time that I've been retired. But uh, I'll, I'll double check that and get back with you. Okay. And I'm kind of curious, um, did you have someone helping you file that claim or did you do it yourself? TBC. Right. So <laughs> I, I think there's like, um, I mean, there could be 180 80 degrees difference in someone helping someone here in Lubbock. You know, we have two people that might help, help from TBC and from TWC helping people file claims, uh, but getting in touch with people is difficult. People ha truly helping people or making sure their whole claim is submitted. It's just a lot of work on veterans. And I've seen a few give up on the process or... Um 
they came back and it wasn't what they were hoping. And so they gave up on all these other things, even though they only got 10% on tinnitus. So, I mean, they're just, they're not, I think there's got to be better help in preparing claims, encouraging veterans to resubmit or submitting supplemental claims. A year a little older, but even if we're starting out a little younger with educating veterans, I mean, people don't realize too that if they get to that 100% total and permanent, that that might open up the door for a Hazelwood veteran and their, you know, their to provide benefits for their families, you know, going to college. Yeah, so, and I w- I would point out may, I, I may be in a unique situation, but uh, you know the uh, VA has a lot of now community centers, and here in New Braunfels, where I live, there is a VA community center, and they are very helpful. Uh, they'll even I think go so far as help, helping you file a claim. Uh, I walk in there and they've got things plaster all over the wall. Be, be sure and file for your PAC Act. Uh, so they're really encouraging veterans to, to file claims. Uh, so that may be helpful too. I don't know if you have something like that in your area or not, but uh, here in New Braunfels, we have a community, a VA community center. Like a CBOC community based app. Yeah. Is it a clinic yeah. too? Okay. The yeah. CBOC and a clinic. Uh-huh. Yeah. We have, we have that here. It's a couple years old now. Uh, but Earl, you were mentioning, knowledge of like healthcare workers or social workers for Mm -hmm. aging veterans too. So it just made me think that, well, and then Colonel Palladino mentioned that, well, the turnover or people changing roles, et cetera. Well, I mean, remember when we had, I forget who it was that was talking about incarcerated veterans and they had kind of an intake. So I don't know if that might be an option too a cause to work for in 2024 is some, if people don't have it in their facilities is some sort of veteran intake. So no matter who is in charge of taking care of that veteran, at least they have the information on like what to look for, how to best help them, this and that. I mean, it, maybe if, if there was interest, it could take a deeper yeah, and, dig into and, that. You know, I'm a, you know, you asked, I submitted my, my claim where I got to set, I did the fully developed claim myself, you know, but I'm a retired medical service corps officer. I, you know, made a PDF file. I went online, did that. I actually submitted my pac claim for myself where I got another 10% for that, you know, it, but I'm a unique case because of the medical service corps officers. But I think you, you, you're hitting on it because we, we got the county service officers, I mean, to ask them. You know, sometimes people don't, don't don't look unless you ask to say, you know, kind of focus on seniors uh, when you when you're in there to go to some of those things or give the information out. Uh, I went to I'm a member of the Houston Police Retired Officers Association as an associate member because my brother's a retired cop. I went to a meeting and I noticed all the little funny baseball caps and I asked the guys there to raise their hands. It was like 40 veterans in the room because my contact with the VA. I got the VA guys from Houston National Cemetery to get regional office in the cemetery because I'm the chairman of a VA committee to come out and do outreach with the, with the with the association. They took 15 and 10 the files at that meeting. So I just say that, that there's that information out there. The the other thing I think we could look at, uh, Sarah, is uh, the count the, the veteran advocates that we have in the hospital. You know, yeah, that social worker she didn't know about that, but those veteran advocates that work for TBC who are out there, that may be something to put on their checklist that say, you know, because I think they have access to to the patient patient record where yeah. they can look. They don't where again that they can work with the patient advocate. I was a patient advocate at VA hospital in DC for eight, uh, eight was uh, seven, three years and then the EA to the director. They could work with the patient advocates at the VA patient advocates at the hospital who are there to maybe make some contact or as they walk around, the if they can get access and walk around the ward to say, let these people know there's a state home and stuff like that. Or again, do the outreach to the guys who are patients in the hospital to see if you want to apply for your claim. Because I can tell you, the VA patient advocates ain't ain't so much going around to tell people about their benefits. They're they're firemen trying to, to handle the problems there. So they don't really have the time to say, should you apply for your claim and all. So that again, that targeted outreach could be our our veterans, uh, the service officers, and the patient advocates who are in the hospital to touch bases with these people. Because I can tell you, you had that brand new hospital, that brand new veterans home in Houston, and I know of two families that didn't know about it, 
And I now I've, I found out there was a social worker working at the hospital who hadn't been told about it. So there's avenues out there. And again, I'm, I mentioned the, the you, you got a good group of uh, YouTube videos and maybe a targeted video for seniors where you can give that to your patient advocates, that you can give that to the service officers. So if they're going to a group, instead of doing a lecture each time and saying, here, when you have your, your BFW meeting, or here, if you got your church meeting, to, to put that information out there. And, and uh, same thing on the other side, uh, that pre-need thing for NCA. I did it myself, even though I'm a service-connected veteran, just to see how the system worked. With the pre-need, where you, you go in there for VA uh, National Cemetery, you go in there, and before you need it, you go in there and say, I want to be on the list. And uh, those of you who haven't done it, what they actually do, you, you, you register online for pre-need for determining when you can get a cemetery plot. You, you get a one-page letter from uh, NCA that comes back to you in the mail that you can uh, the veteran can put in his or her file there with the life insurance policy and all that. So when you go into the cemetery director, instead of trying to make the national call and all that stuff right then, you got that where you can say here. Bubba is already enrolled. So there's some things that we could do with the senior veterans to get them ready for, you know, if, if they're automatically discharged, they're all going to qualify for a cemetery. So tell them about the pre-need, tell them about the state veteran homes and things out there, at least to help them as they get older, because those of you who are out there in the field with us, a lot of times they don't think about the VA until they're real sick in the hospital or the person has died. Then they start asking the question and the poor family members then trying to pull all that information together. So you, so you agree that outreach to senior veterans could be a topic for us to look at? Yeah. I see you, I see you head nodding. Anything yeah. else? Anything else? Any, uh, any other areas that you can think that we might want to look at as the first thing this year? That's a lot if it's done properly, I can assure you. We've talked about the general outreach that's already being done. We've talked about, we've agreed on targeted outreach. And Angela, would you be the person we talked to about talking about the, the feasibility of a YouTube video? Absolutely. I've got folks who make them right here in the room right hey. now. So. Hey. We could also do the surveys uh, as well, if that's something that you could decide you'd like to do as an action item, is our department as well organizes the survey uh, responses for the agency. So if that's one that you want to add on here too, we are happy to create one and can work on, I don't know if you guys have an established list, but a BFW, American Legions, et cetera, that we can reach out to across the state to get a good part. And then I think just the other one that you'd mentioned off the top that we'd sent there was the um, less than honorable discharge mm -hmm. one as well. Yeah, that, that video, uh, uh, and I don't know, if, and again, when you talk about things that's already there, uh, helping veterans to to maybe get their, their discharge upgraded, I would think, if somebody help me with it, I would think the first group that's already looking at that is probably our incarcerated veteran program people. Don't they try to help veterans who are incarcerated get their uh, discharges upgraded? Anybody know? Not sure. Okay. So that'd be another area, Angela. That would be another area besides the general outreach is uh, is uh, county service officers giving it information on on the discharge upgrades. I'm sorry, Earl. Could you repeat yeah, that? Yeah, no problem. We were bringing the the, uh, the group out there needing help would be. Veterans with less than honorable discharges, maybe again that could be in the overall uh, or a separate YouTube video itself on how to do that. And I, I was just saying, I don't know if the people who work with the incarcerated veterans program could that could be something that could be tied in with that group. So the the county service officers and the hospital advocates looking at targeted outreach to get senior veterans to apply for their benefits and the people who work with the incarcerated veteran program to look at that side of assisted veterans to, to turn them on to groups uh, so they could help them try to get their discharges upgraded. Uh, are justice involved is mm -hmm. with the veterans mental health mm -hmm. department and everything. So, I mean, if you end yeah, up wanting to have Blake discuss something yeah. next time too, uh, yeah. Dr. Harris, we could. Yeah. 
let's let's do that because we worked the heck out of Blake last year. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, no. He nodded his head. Uh, so what about having Blake talk about what they do with the incarcerated veterans program as far as upgrading discharges and anything else? Question, uh, question I had, uh, did we get any kind of breakdown? You know, last year they authorized two new outreach uh, service officers who were going to be taking claims online, but we, you know, we had a proposal about extending the hours, and when they hired two new people and who were going to work on uh, claims online in, in, in the hours after 4.30, did we get an update on how they're doing? Certainly, I'll reach out. Okay. You remember that one, guys, that uh, they did the trial, and they got, what, like 50-some out, uh, up 50 some out claims that were applied for uh, during that 30 day period without advertising them, just having the time slots on there. So when they hired two new outreach people, they hired two new outreach people just to do outside claims based on our recommendations. So I'm asking for an update on that for our next meeting to see how that's working out. Absolutely. Sorry, uh, two items I want to bring us back to. Um, our general counsel notified me that we may have skipped six, the election of our committee vice chair. Oh. And then additionally, Mr. Patterson is on his way up, who is our public comment. Oh, okay. So I would provide both. I think we may have time to get the vice chair done before then, if we can return. Okay. Great, we started talking. <laughs> we came in, we, I <laughs> that's, I yeah, that's exactly when I came in. Right now, uh, again, thank you for for working with me again as the chair. Um, and Kitty, th uh, thank you for, for still hanging in there with us and just uh, give me a chance to work back in here. I appreciate that. But we do need a vice chair. So the floor is open for nominations for vice chair of our advisory committee. Do we have any nominations? Mm. Mm. I've, I've served as vice chair before and uh, I understand the importance of it. Uh, my plate is full with other commitments and I'm a stickler. If I make a commit, if I make a offer to do something, I'm going to be certain that I can fulfill it. And I candidly uh, have concerns about, I already know how many, much time I'll be even out of town, out of country this year. And I, I just hesitate to make that offer. Uh, because I will, I, I can see several absences if I did it. Okay. I saw the question back at you, Earl. Who who you want as your vice? That's the, like I do like you did at the Alamo and draw a line if you ain't fast enough to move away. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Larry ought to be vice. Larry, I, consider I, I promise try to make all the meetings. You said what? I say, would you consider being vice? You've been nominated. Sound like you be, you've been nominated for being vice. I just heard a, a nomination for you being vice. Do you accept the nomination? Not really, but I'll do it. But <laughs> if nobody else is going to jump in. I, I'm I'm kind of in the same boat as Jim. Been there, done that. But you know, I'm I'm down for the team if needed. Yeah. Well, you. I'll, I'm retired, retired, so I got I got the time. So I'll, I think I'll be able to be around the majority of the time. So so you know I'm driving down from Richmond to do that, and they they at least let me come in the night before, so I don't have to try to get here leaving at four o'clock in the morning. So I still plan on being able to serve. So if if Larry, if Larry is willing willing to take the helm, anybody else want to nominate themselves? What about you, Cat? <laughs> Everybody, I, I am so far in the weeds with uh, Moa stuff that there's no way. Well, we got one name nomination for Larry. He said, "Okay, kind of." We got no, we got no more. So uh, I move that the nominations I, be closed on Larry. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go ahead his nomination. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, right. Jim. Thanks. Yeah, well. <laughs> Thank you. All right, this, this, this is how they did it at the Alamo. They drew the line in the dirt and they, Bubba didn't pay attention and he still stood there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Larry. So we got Larry as the vice chair. So it, does that count as an official nomination by James and uh, second by Kitty, right? 
I don't know. Jim. Second about Jim. Second about Jim. Yeah, I oh. second. So wait, who was first then? Uh, uh, Cunningham. Uh, Jim Cunningham. Brennan, Brennan second. Oh, James and Jim. Sorry, that's oh, me off. All right. <laughs> they, you don't usually do that. J and J like the band aid company. <laughs> Excellent. Well, all right. So Larry is our vice chair. And as I mentioned before, our uh, public comment has arrived. Mr. Pat Patterson is here. And thank you, sir. We and as noted in the materials, you have five minutes to speak to address for our committee. And our camera's up there if you feel like looking up at that. And of course, here's our camera right there. Do we need to formally vote no. on what we feel? And you can sit as well. I'm sorry. Do we need to vote on Larry's deal? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. All in favor? Yeah, just to formalize it. All in favor of Larry being vice chair? Aye. 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 All opposed? You matter. Thank you, sir. Should I disregard that? Yeah, just disregard okay. Yeah. Uh, kidding, right? Yeah. Okay. Confirm. All right. Otherwise, for the minutes, I'm gonna have to put down that. I just heard my name. I and Larry's got the job, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, here we go, sir. Thank you. All right, good morning. My name is Pat Patterson. I'm a veteran service officer. And the issue that I want to bring to y'all's attention right now is I think that we have some uh, F, uh former POWs, uh, and perhaps their surviving spouses that are still alive, but are not getting all the benefits that they're entitled to. And I, I bring that up as a point uh, because I know that if we look at the, uh, the Veterans Benefits Administration, basically their down in the weeds guidebook, the M21-1, it says that there was a little over 600 uh, uh, former POWs that returned for, uh, back to the United States. However, now, if we look, we will find that the BHA, Health Administration, has their numbers. The VBA, Benefits Administration, has their numbers. And none of the three of them coincide with each other. So what that's telling me is there's some people who are using the Veterans Benefits Administration that are getting their compensation, their pension, but they don't know about their compensation pension and then vice versa. There's people in the Veterans Health Administration that don't know anything about the Veterans Benefits Administration. So those two uh, lists from the VHA and the VBA should easily uh, average out. Uh, they should tell each other about, hey, here's my list. Uh, let's re uh, resolve some redundancy and let's go through and look at them. And when I say look at them, the VA is required by law uh, to accept a DD-214 as proof that they are, in fact, a uh, POW. And there's been a lot of them in there. And what I fear is when we put those numbers together, they're going to be higher than what came back from Vietnam. But I still believe there are surviving spouses and former v uh, POWs that are out there, and we don't even know about it. Now, the reason, the way that we can tackle this problem is if we can get a hard push on the veteran service officers, the state service organization, the Texas Veterans Commission, and get the VA involved too, that we, boots on the ground, start making visits and have presentations to nursing homes and to assisted livings where most of those former POWs and surviving spouses would be. Uh, so to let them know you have these type of benefits. But again, the list is going to come together and there's going to be some on there that have been not been completely vetted. And that's the bad side of the coin is, and in fact, I have paperwork on one individual now that I want, has been sanitized. I want to show to the, uh, the chairman. We have bad actors out there. And as much as we want to provide benefits for all of our veterans, at the same time, we want to protect the integrity of the title uh, former prisoner of war. And so, and also being good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And so there's, there's two sides there that we need to work on. We need to work on our outreach. And I think that's easy enough to do, uh, getting backing and buy-in from the other stakeholders. 
And we also need the VA to go through and do an administrative decision on all of those uh, claimed to be former POWs. Hopefully that list isn't many. Hopefully the, the two lists co coincide a little bit, but I'm not sure. I've heard a, a lot of different numbers. But that's my proposal. I don't know if everybody, did you send this out to everybody that I sent you? I did not receive my that. I talking received, points? You, I never received that from you. However, I did send everyone the uh, speaker's note that you had filled out, but I did not receive those talking points. Okay. I apologize. Everything that I just talked about is in uh, this two pages, and it doesn't escape me that I may not have been able to uh, put your name in there right or something like that. We will have these notes to you hopefully before the end of the day. Do I have any questions I could entertain right now? Anything? Anybody? I hope when you get a chance to look at this and, and digest it, that if you do find any uh, questions or concerns, uh, that you'll get, a, get in touch with me. I'd be more than happy to, uh, uh, to discuss them with you. All right, thank, thank you, sir. sir. And under Any <laughs> questions, comments from the group? Then I have one to give you. No, yeah, I think you know, uh, Earl. I think that kind of goes back to some of the previous discussion that that we just had. This in the cross communication, different different systems. Uh, even though you have liaisons, even though you have points of contact, sometimes those systems still do not talk to each other. Almost like Army and Army Reserve, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think any way we can get those to just to better cross communicate, or maybe there just has to intentionally be a, a body that that does that um, continuum of information relaying and so forth. So I'd be interested if there's someone specifically designated to ensure the support of or the benefits awareness for a spouse when that veteran is no longer alive. Yeah, uh, let me put on my. VA hat. I'm chairman of the VA former prisoner of war advisory committee. Uh, I'm guess you say I'm a glutton for punishment. What what Pat has brought up here is something that our committee has brought up uh, at our last meeting, and you can go to the VA website and see see the minutes. As the chair, I brought up a uh, comment because VA gave us a lot of data, and they actually gave us uh, you know they've gone they've gone through and scrubbed who's in receipt of benefits, which is different than the normal living POW. The only numbers that the VA will swear by are the POWs that they say are in their system, either receiving benefits or getting care. Uh, they've been kicking the overall total number of living POWs down the road real, real far. Uh, when I first got on the committee four years ago, I was looking at the 2015 POW fact sheet that they had, and they said they had an estimate of 15,000 living POWs. The last meeting we had last, last year, that number's been kicked around because DOD has what they said were POWs back then. VA talks about who's in the system, then you got a delta in between. To give you a wide example, on the VA fact sheet in 2015, they had an estimate of 15,000 living POWs. When I had my meeting last year, the VA was estimating a little over, I think it was 2,200 POWs in the system. So this identifies an outreach that's a continuous outreach mission they have. But also when you looked at the numbers, just off the top of my head, because uh, we were looking at the charts that they gave us, they give us all the charts, but I was we were looking at the number of people who are getting care within the VA, but not getting benefits. And that was a little a number a little less than 200. And when you look at if you're getting care, care for the VA, and you look at all the presumptive illnesses for POW, we were saying, Lord, you know, uh, and, 90, and, and the people who were in the, in the healthcare system who were getting benefits, like 90% of them were getting benefits. So you start to say, this rounded off 200 people who are getting care but not getting benefits. Somebody needs to talk to them and say, Bubba, you know, let's look at your 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 your, your medical problem list and compare that to the presumptives and, and get you with a claims person. We're we're working with VA on that. So so if you want to bring that up formally, I'll you know you can submit the letter to this committee and then I can use that to say you know as a friend of the court or whatever submit it there. But we are asking them to look at that. Uh, the only benefit you get for being a POW working with the system 
if you're not getting benefits from the VA as a POW, if you're a verified POW, you can qualify for care from VA as a priority group three. So if you say an honorable discharge veteran who, who is a POW, you know, he, he or she can get an added benefit by being a prior group three for being a POW, that's it. Now you talk about disability, the dis, you first have, you have to have the disability and then the disability has to be a presumptive of being a POW. Now, there's not a POW disability, healthcare disability, but there are presumptives. So again, you, you, you uh, people are always worried about the stolen dollar thing. Are they getting money for being a POW? Well, they got to get, they got to have the medical ailment. Now, if that medical ailment that they got that they're getting paid for is a presumptive, then that's, that's in that, that gray area. So you're bringing up some areas if you go through yeah. that, that, that we've talked about there. And, and again, it, it, that's submitted through the TBA. And, and since I'm on the committee, you, uh, the TBA gets it to me that I could, I could send it up to my VA points of contact, but there is a need for outreach there because that there's a, a big, there's a number out there. It's got to, you know, if five, if seven years ago, they were estimating 15,000, you only got 2,000 in the VA system. There seems to be an outreach requirement for that. Chair, I'm sorry. That, that is not what we, we can put this on the agenda for the next mm -hmm. um, okay. yeah. meeting, but we can't go. Yeah, okay, don't go in line. Yeah. Right. So if he wants to bring that up, the, the general counsel is keeping me straight. <laughs> so we we can bring that up. Yeah, if, if 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 Pat gives us this, then then he can submit that to the committee and 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 then the committee, if the committee wants me to uh, submit that further up uh, TDC, I can do it from there. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. And then we return to X now, discussion of agenda items, date, time, and location for the next committee meeting. Okay. Uh, Earl? Um, yeah. Earl? Uh, Jim Cunningham. Yeah. Uh, before before we go to that item, can I add one thing to uh, our earlier discussion about VA compensation? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I found uh, what I was looking for. It's, it addresses concurrent receipt of VA compensation and military retired pay. Yeah. Um, and it basically says that uh, you can get concurrent receipt of co VA compensation and military re re retired pay under combat related special compensation or CRSC and or concurrent retired and disability pay programs. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, CRDP is determined by DFAS and the CRSC is determined by application through DD form 2860. Now, in order to get the uh, concurrent compensation under CRDP, which is the retired pay, uh, you have to have a combined VA service connected evaluation of 50% or greater, and you must have at least 20 years service. You do not need to apply for it, it's just automatic. Whereas the combat related, you have to apply for. But yeah. uh, that that basically is telling you whether or not your retirement would be reduced at all be, through uh, compensation from the VA. Yeah, and that's exactly what my situation was. Uh, I, my disability wasn't combat related, so so I was getting that offset. But when they changed that rule later on, you know, when I applied and I got greater than fifty percent. That they didn't mean my retirement pay. Excuse me, this is uh, Kathy Cordova for the record, General Counsel. If you're speaking, would you please put your camera on? Oh, she got to see you, Jim. Hi, I just said all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly what my case was because that was another reason I didn't apply later on in life because it wasn't combat related. And then when they changed the rule, you know, I kind of delayed a while. I said, heck with it. But then I kind of realized I had more than 20 years at that level. I said, you know, all they, they can't tell, if they tell me, no, I'm in good shape. So that, that's a good point. But again, you, who knows that out there, the general population that knows that out there. And again, how many people are out there whose lives could change if they go from being 20% to 70% or greater? That's the line. And again, that the other thing that's magical about that 50% level rule, then that qualifies you from long-term care from the VA when you start talking about the VA paying for per diem at a state nursing home. I have something to say before we assist out. <laughs> As the director of the VAP, um, I feel like this meeting has been hijacked a little bit and want to know if uh, 
anybody on the committee, if we're moving forward with continuing to look over items within the BP wide manuals that were never looked at and other items, is that going to continue or um, is the BP oh, done no, moving? No, 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 <laughs> it is, yeah. no, everything no. has been talked about claims and uh, outreaches, but we didn't really go over the piece of no, and I, I Honestly, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up. No, it's it, we've got carte blanche, and that's what we're talking about is future topics. And and on the Veterans Enterprise Program, the first briefing got messed up because of the, the logistics on the call. You gave us an update. If you think there are some other things for us to look at on there, we'd be glad to look at that. Well, we did. There was a couple meetings that we did. I did have with Kitty, and we. There was two different committees that were formed that were supposed to look out. I gave her all of my documents for facing to uh, the community, and there's never been a review or resolution of those. So I was just wondering, like, I'm continuing to update these documents and go over them to better my program. <laughs> we are trying to get an exceptional item coming up, and part of that was going over what I need to do to assist in that expansion. And it- Oh, you know what, Kitty, Kitty, I'm glad you're on the call. I think what happened, we had the, correct me if I'm wrong, because I started going back in my notes. When we first started looking at the uh, Veteran Enterprise Program, we did break down in our subgroups and our subgroups, you know, I know I was on the group that was looking at the website, and something like that, and we had some notes that that, that we made, the subcommittees had some notes that were, were presented to you. I think that there's a group of, uh, there's some stuff that was missed between that August meeting and out because the subcommittees did, we did have our subcommittee meeting and we had, and we, we talked about those things that, that we came up with our subcommittees. But I think when we didn't, have, when that meeting got cut off, we didn't get to a discussion of those subcommittee notes, did we? Wasn't that the meeting that we were supposed to, the one that we had to cut out? Wasn't that the one where we were going to be discussing what the subcommittees did? Yeah, I. that's the one where the, the Zoom just totally collapsed on us. So we did miss the discussion of those those subcommittee notes, right? Well, I think we reviewed them. I'm not sure how much conversation we were able to have about it. The meeting got cut off because of the, the video, right? Correct. Skills with, yeah. So, do we have? I can go back. I think I have the stuff from my subcommittee group that we were looking at. We probably need to go back to that because we because you're well, right. I, because, because I'm hoping. I would hope that the that the um, actual committee reports would be included in the minutes, and I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I think they get that's that's the gap. Because we we were our subcommittees were talking about we're ready to talk about what we came up with in between the meetings on that last call, but then it stopped. Yes, I, I wasn't here, of course, yeah. for that one. I hadn't started the agency yet. So in the August go to webinar, we just approved, of course, at the top of the meeting an agenda item uh, for the minutes, and there was no subcommittee report. Um, for that, in fact, I had not been informed at this point yet that there were subcommittees created off of this committee. Yeah, so. we did have that. Okay. Yeah, I'll go back and look at, you guys remember that? Because we met, we met and we're ready to do the discussion and that, that meeting got stopped because of the, the, the AB stuff. I mean, we can create this as an agenda item to provide that. Yeah, we, need, we need to follow. I go. I can go back and listen. I think I, I had, I think I was a subcommittee guy for the, the website and the other, because we may, I think I, I still have my notes at home on that. So we probably need to close that out. So for our next meeting, okay. let's, let's, let's do that. If you guys can go back and look at what we talked about on the subcommittee set, that's what we were discussing when the call got stopped because the AB stuff got. So well, we're just back on the discussion for an agenda yeah. item coming up. Right. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit our comments on the Veterans uh, Entrepreneur Program. At our next meeting. And so has the report been submitted to the full committee or was it just in the subcommittee? Yeah. Okay.
And who would have the notes on that? I think I still Megan. have stuff on. Yes, ma'am. The, the individual committees uh, would, I would think they would have their notes, but we tried to, you know, Megan was taking notes for the for the actual meeting, the one that crashed. Kenny, did we send our stuff to Elaine that the subcommittees had, or did we or did we send them to you? Because I thought I sent you my notes. El Elaine wasn't. Elaine was gone already. Elaine, yeah. Elaine was mm -hmm. gone by then. Yeah. Do you have? Because I thought and I sent I, you the. I'm the, sorry, Cindy. Cindy was yes. there taking the notes, so she should have whatever we had. Can yes, which I, go ahead, Megan. You can go. I was just going to say I sent the notes that we had because that meeting was cut short. Um, but Megan had provided some notes on what you were going to present that day for the EP. But we never really got to that because the go to webinar never worked properly. So that ought to be, if we go back to our emails one from what, August? We were getting ready yeah. for the last meeting. That should, should have gone between us back then. So we do, we, we do, you're right. We need to revisit that because we didn't close it out. We started the discussion, but it stopped. Correct. So that made it hard for you to give the update because we didn't really get all the discussion. Yeah. Correct. She never gave the update because we never, it, it got cut like 15 minutes into it yeah because i think because you saw you saw what our, our notes were before the meeting where we were talking about what we saw on the website and all that did you see that if i did i would go back and look these subcommittee notes all i have are the minutes from the last meeting um so for the sake of the upcoming agenda what should i call this item Thank you. Yeah, that stopped when the call stopped. So uh, one more update that I do have is um, our veteran-owned business logo that we were, uh, once we certify a veteran-owned business as at minimum 51% veteran-owned and run in the state of Texas, or um, we provide them with the, the logo that we're trying to get trademarked. And then at one point we did have a letter. We recently changed that letter and we now have a certificate that we actually print them out and we bought um, embossers with the state seal and we're embossing each certificate and mailing that certificate with the two stickers to the veteran um, so that they have something to hang on their wall at their business location. Um, so question on, question on that one. Uh, is there a plan for those that are already uh, registered? Will they will something go out letting them know if they want to have that this new certificate to be able to submit for it? I, I guess how's that going to kind of work? We haven't thought that far ahead. Okay. Um, we've certified quite a few, um, probably close to sixty five hundred mm -hmm. already since twenty. 20 when it began so that would it would be a lot on us as a five-person team to go back and <laughs> reprint and mail out all of those if they are still in business if somebody wants them and we're talking to them on the phone providing consulting services we do tell them and we do offer to reprint it but uh, as a general statement to the public to reprint all of those it would be very taxing on my small program. Tied into that, I understand the logistics of doing the letter, but is there a way of having on the TVC website a listing of, of you know those those eight all those places that have already been approved? So it's two hundred instead of you having to send two hundred letters out, but you've got a file that says who those two hundred are. Where if, if, if I'm getting ready to hire. A business I can in that in that business saying that they're approved by TVC that I can go to that link and see that they're telling the truth or not. Yeah. As the owner of the website, I don't think that we'd want to put a list that large on our website. So we do work really closely with the Houston Veterans Chamber of Commerce, and they do have an interactive map that 
and we direct veterans to that, to um, to become part of that listing on their website. So our our certificate as a veteran-owned business is solely for marketing purposes only. It, they can't do anything with it, but it, it is for those businesses that are not interested in um, any sort of contract at the state, local, or federal levels. I, I would honestly be interested in seeing if there's a way to even potentially subcontract for mass distribution of the certificate. Just thinking of the piece of the pride of being a veteran, especially now if it seems like you're trying to go more towards an official type of a cert certification piece to go to go on a business wall that hopefully uh, garners more traffic or more support for a veteran organization. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just really thinking about those that already are and what's the best way, especially if you have a smaller team, that TVC can be able to say, hey, this may have a greater, bigger impact um, across the state for those that have already gone through this process to be designated. Um, how does it get TVC's name a little bit further out there as a no wrong door, you know, those types of things. Okay. That, that could be a recommendation. That we'll Again, I can pull the numbers. I recently um, got updated numbers from the Secretary of State on um, the veteran businesses, and so I'll, I can go through there and, you know, look at everything and make sure. And if we have, you know, depending on what that number is, I we can possibly work with it. And I also want to go out to the uh, veteran business outreach centers at some of the campuses. That is like a a gold mine of all the people you want to hit. Yeah. Or what? Uh, state, Greg, state your question again or comment. Do you want to reach out to the veteran business outreach centers at our campuses, like at UT Arlington? Or, I, I'm not understanding what you're asking. Okay, if, if the goal is to try and make sure the message gets out to folks who want to apply for uh, their veteran business being uh, recognized by TVC. Unless I missed something here. Oh no, we like we're completely like we're finally on track. We're not behind. We're not like we're operating in a twenty-four to forty-eight hour turnaround currently, with all five of us working daily on on certifying um, the veteran verification letter and the veteran-owned business logos. In addition to, we're trying to bring back that one-on-one -on -one consulting that we haven't been able to do because we did have that seventy-five day backlog. So we're slowly bringing it back. We are working with um, UT Arlington, uh, the VBOX, to um, work closely with them to bring in that, that consulting piece. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And, I, and I think with Greg bringing that up, too, you know, not only just the veteran business offices, I think understanding more so what is the desired outcome with the new certif certificate, this whole process, understanding, too, that you have a small team. But for example, every year you have the Veterans Edge Conference that happens down in Dallas. Um, you know, is is this supposed to be something more that's outreach, uh, pride type of a thing, of an effort by TVC? So then there's there does there now with this certificate, not having seen what it looks like, but you know, now having the certificate, it's sealed, all that type of stuff. Is there now going to be need a more intentional outreach and engagement and awareness of this um, at things like the Veterans Edge Conference, uh, veteran pitch competitions and stuff that are going on where you're gonna run into people that otherwise would not know about it. Yes, that is our hope is to get out there and be uh, more proactive on the topic and with explaining, hey, we do have this certificate. The certificate, um, the logo was born in 2020 when the legislation ended for the, the waiver of the state registration fees. That's when it came into play. And in 2025, if the legislation does not um, is not passed again or 
goes inactive and is not become permanent, then we will be back to only processing logos for veterans because there won't be that state um, benefit for the veterans to waive their fees. So yes, we are trying to get out and do more outreaches, but if we have one person out, it throws us in that tailspin and we are so spread throughout the state that it is almost impossible to make all of these outreaches and go to all of these places having four people. Yeah. And that may be a topic there, um, you know, uh, regarding how do we support them in coming up with a ramp up timeline, potential additional, what's funding is probably going to be needed for an outreach team type of a thing, right? Um, because it sounds like, especially if you can do that evaluation of how many are you receiving, how long does it take to fill them out? Almost kind of like going in higher education when you're talking about filling out the GI Bill and so forth, right? We don't want to start having the same issue here with this program as what we've all seen and know happens in higher education when administration kind of looks at the veteran service offices. I got a question. Sure. Uh, sometimes we don't look at our own family. This is why I'm going there. If we have, if the state has a vet preference program for contracting, is there a requirement for state agencies to review your list as they're putting contracts out to be sure that they uh, at least contacted or, or uh, checked into the possibility of hiring? one of these companies that has, you know, like I'm thinking about the, the transportation. If I got an asphalt company and I, I'm in your program, I would think if the state was billing, you know, a highway or a spur out in, in Harris County or something, that I'd be looking at that list. Is there any requirement for, since you have a state preference for the, the guys, the, the contracting officers with those state, those state contractors, those state agency contractors, to review your list before they put contracts out or to notify these people some, in some way? They would go through the Secretary of State for that list. We don't have, like, the Secretary of State and the Comptroller is the most active, the the accurate list. Uh, up until I don't know, recently, the majority of veterans will come to us, mm -hmm. ask for that veteran verification letter, get it. We assist them through the process of creating their business. And then they go away. And like, we're trying well, to yeah, bring and, them back. It's not like when you got a best preference program and dollars are spent and state funds are going out, it'd be curious to know how many companies who are in the veteran entrepreneur program have contract with state organizations. Chair, I think we need to probably bring it in. Because I'm I'm trying to I'm struggling to put these under these is yeah, under, we under items seven and eight and, yeah. and they're, they're very specific. So if you look at seven and eight. Yeah. Hey, can I can I just interject, Chair? Um we what my job is here today, well is that because because it's it would be unfair to a veteran who's looking at this agenda from Dallas, Fort Worth, Sutton, San Antonio, and I'm not tuning in because none of this discussion is in on the agenda. So, so it's unfair to them because they don't they do not know that this is going to be discussed. So, I mean, it's, it's a top it's not related to it's not, not not in the agenda where I would know if I had interest in it. Too. Right. So yeah. if we want to discuss it in for you know further. Then I would suggest we put on the agenda so that some veteran out there sees it and says, "Oh, I want to hear this discussion." Okay. Well, for for the veteran entrepreneur program is to review the subcommittee mm -hmm. comments and then also a general discussion on outreach for the, the program, which would include if if somebody is uh, on the list and how they know about it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So. Could we just have that as the an overall review of the veteran entrepreneur program would be the review of the, the past subcommittee notes and further uh, outreach slash uh, program initiatives. Okay. okay, we'll do that. Okay, because we we you, I see what you said. We're getting into a discussion that that could be followed up exactly. later on. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Okay. 
I think we got enough for next for next one to just talk about veteran entrepreneurial <laughs> program. And then uh, I think we, it, uh, Angela, if we have time for it to again look at uh, targeted outreach. So veteran entrepreneurial program and targeted outreach to senior veterans. Those two topics for our next meeting. I also have so far in the notes that I've been taking, um, so targeted outreach mm -hmm. to senior veterans, mm -hmm. but as well as um, inviting Mr. Harris, Dr. Harris to discuss with us the mm -hmm. services for less than honorable as well. Um, as, as well as uh, asking for an update from claims on the pos uh, extended hours online and if the status of that. So those are now up to um, five agenda items that I have for next. Am I, am I correct? Did I miss something? That's what That's I got probably, to do. We would probably want to talk for those. If, if you says we could put those as possible, but, but definitely let's limit it to two next time. Update on the veteran entrepreneurial program and, and the uh, and and we I think we got time for um, the targeted outreach. Well, and of course, tomorrow you'll be presenting that because I was under our discussion area nine of an area for focus for fiscal year 24, and you'll be presenting that to the commission tomorrow as a topic. Correct. Next meeting will be able to two. All right. So for next meeting, remove the other agenda items, only have the um, the one on discuss targeted outreach to veterans over the age of 55. And then um, I then agenda item two would include a VEB update from subcommittee comments and then out general discussion on outreach for the program to include the state list. Okay, cool. Sorry, just <laughs> you have to keep it straight for tomorrow, too. Yeah. So those two definite topics from next next time, the entrepreneurial program, the targeted outreach, and the update. Okay. All right. I think we got it. Now, the, the next meeting, uh, we normally meet the day before, I mean, the day before the commission. So when is the next commission meeting? Next commission meeting is uh, scheduled for Thursday, May 16th. However, the commission does need to approve that tomorrow, just to make sure that they're still aligned, but that that's what I have listed as the next one. So that would have us then meeting on Wednesday, May 15th, if we want to stay with our current schedule. I would propose that we do that. Is that okay with the, the body? The day before the commission is like we did before. And if it changes, then we'll come back. What day? May the 15th. That was, that's what you were saying, right? Correct. May the 15th at 10 a.m. And it, it's subject to change if the commission has changed their meeting, but they probably won't. Yeah, it works for me right now. Okay. And Wednesday was usually a pretty good day for us anyway. When the Tuesday, Wednesdays and Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesdays were, were our good days before. Okay. If you just want to extend an invitation again to anyone who you want to come join us in this lovely room. <laughs> yes, it's a nice room. <laughs> if you're close, if you're close in, in the uh, the hotel you put me in last night, if you you have a problem with, with trying to drive in, is a five minute walk. Was good? It was okay. <laughs> My wife would want to stay. She, to <laughs> she, she likes the Marriott. <laughs> All right. So our uh, next meeting will be the 15th of May, subject to change. And we have our topics. I will entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. J and J again. <laughs> Thank you, folks, and, and happy new year. All in favor. All. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. All. All in favor. Aye. All opposed. <laughs> Thank you. I'm. No, I'm so. This group never opposes. That's done. But enjoy your Fat Tuesday. Get your ass on Ash Wednesday.